Society. Welcome to the fourth Network Book Forum in our four-part series, spotlighting the new book by Dr. Julia Tacona called Left to Our Own Devices. Uh, Julia is a Data and Society alumnus. She was one of our postdocs. I'm Jenna Burrell, the Director of Research at Data and Society, and I'm going to be your host today alongside my colleagues, Nazeli and Rigo, who are behind the curtain. Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. Data and Society began in New York City, an island node in a large network of hills, rivers, and mountains in the Atlantic Northeast, known as Lenape Hoking the ancestral land of the Leni Lenape people. Today, we're connected online via a different network. I'm coming to you from Oakland, California, and behind me is the New Bay Bridge. We're connected through a vast array of servers, humans, and computers. In the United States, much of the system sits on stolen land acquired under the extractive logic of white settler expansion. As an organization, we recognize this history and uplift, uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people, data, and territory around the world. And we commit to dismantling all ongoing settler colonial practices and their material implications on our digital worlds. If you don't know what land you're, you're living on in the United States, you can look it up. I'm living on Ohlone land over here in Oakland, California. Left to our own devices, Coping with Insecure Work in the Digital Age is the book we're discussing today. It's a new book by Dr. Julia Tacona. Her book looks across a heterogeneous group of workers, ranging from white collar knowledge workers to low wage workers, people working in public relations and government contractors, retail and restaurant workers living in different regions of the United States. She uses in-depth ethnographic interviews to examine the, their practices and seeks to understand the strategies workers use to get by, um, what she calls digital hustling. And I was struck by the surprising commonalities she finds across all of these workers who vary significantly in terms of their status and wage differences. But she also found very different degrees of vulnerability and agency over their working conditions. The theme of workers seeking control, autonomy, and agency is a theme that's a favorite of mine. It's long guided my own research as well, looking at how people resist in the face of tech. Um, there's a quote from her book that I like, which is about how for these workers, digital technologies were essential to resisting work and regaining some autonomy and control over their experiences of insecure work. I'm sure we will talk about that. We're also joined today by the director of our Labor Futures Program here at Data and Society, Aiha Nguyen. Um, she has a long history of experience in working with labor movements and in her career prior to, prior to Data and Society. She worked to raise job standards for retail airport and other service workers and addressed issues of food access, safety and security and local governance. Um, she will have some comments after Julia presents this book um, and I'm sure we can call upon her to weigh in a bit on the, the uh, implications of, of Julia's book for policy and practice. And then let me just briefly introduce um, Dr. Julia Tacona. She's an assistant professor at the Annenberg School of Communication at University of Pennsylvania. She has a PhD in sociology from the University of Virginia. She was a postdoc here at Data and Society. She's now one of our faculty affiliates. She's also an associate fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture at UVA and a grad, graduate of Wellesley College, and she's a third generation teacher. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Julia, for about 10 minutes or so of comments about your book. Um, we're really excited to hear you talk about it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jenna. Um, and just a couple of other thank yous um, before I get started. Um, first to the Data and Society events team, especially um, Nazali, but everybody who, who touched this. I know there are lots of hands um, working on these events and they are amazing. I can tell you from the point of view of an author, thank you so much. Um, and also to Aiha and Jenna for their generosity both today in like participating and getting ready for this event, but also over the years. Um, this relationship goes, goes back a while. Um, and this book and me as a researcher have benefited immensely um, from engaging with both of you. 
And last, um, to my parents who are actually entertaining my toddler right now, so I can do this event, and to my parents' neighbors whose daughter's room I am using right now <laughs> because my parents' house is very noisy. So thank you to all of these people who are helping this event happen today. So my book, uh, as Jenna said, Left to Our Own Devices, um, came out with Oxford University Press a couple months ago. Um, I wanted to tell a little bit about how this book got started, a bit about, um, I know there are some PhD students, some graduate students on the call, um, about what, you know, how it got started, how it, you know, became what it is. I'll talk really briefly about some goals, um, the major goals that I have for the book, and then really quickly over some of the major findings that I think um, might be most interesting to this group. So I started researching this book in 2012, 2013, um, as my dissertation project, um, as a sociologist of work and inequality, as, as Jenna mentioned. And I was really frustrated um, that it seemed like all anyone could talk about at this time, which feels like a million years ago now, um, was about white collar workers and their technologies, right? Um, when I, you know, as a kid growing up in a working class town, working jobs, you know, from subway sandwich artist to being like a shot girl in a sports bar in college, it was incredibly obvious to me that technologies like smartphones, um, especially in the wake of two, the 2008 financial crisis, were central to people's abilities to piece together these kinds of precarious and insecure jobs. But the literature at the time was really focused on these kind of always on white collar work cultures and how digital technologies were kind of extending or exacerbating those kinds of cultures. It wasn't really speaking to the experiences that I've had um, or to many of the people that I knew uh, at that point. So as I designed and started to carry out this research as a graduate student, um, companies like Uber started to take over the news cycle. Um, and all of a sudden, low-wage service workers were at the center of a brand new and huge public conversation about the role of digital technologies in work because of these new apps and platforms. Uh, so this caused me a lot of graduate student anxiety at the time, um, feeling like you know my study was no longer relevant, my contribution that I had to say was no longer relevant. Um, but I was stuck with it at this point. I was already doing interviews. I had already proposed. Um, this is a feeling that many of you might be able to relate to. Um, but, you know, as time went on, I really realized that this conversation, this public conversation that I was so anxious to be a part of um, as a graduate student, was very focused on a really small population of workers. Um, estimates, you know, our best estimates of this really difficult to estimate population or about 1% of Americans overall depend in some way on platforms to earn some money. Um, and it was really missing the upwards of 40% of American workers who were doing many different kinds of insecure and contingent work, but not using a dedicated app or a few apps in order to do it. So, you know, digital technologies also play a huge, huge role in propping up these other kinds of work. But our public conversations about the so-called future of work and the gig economy have really been missing the forest for the trees. And that unfortunately has not changed much um, in the intervening years. So the goals for this book, I have two major goals. Um, first, that a handful of technology companies should not get to define what counts as the gig economy. Precarious work has a history it was not invented by Uber after the 2008 financial crisis, um, and its roots go very deep and are really important to understanding um, the way that gendered and racial inequality as well as class inequality looks in this country today. So when we get beyond app or even tech-centric definitions of this kind of work, we start to see a much bigger picture of the kinds of technologies that are actually involved and their importance. Um, we start to th see things like the things that I focus on uh, in this book, the political economy of the low end consumer market for smartphones, which is not a sexy topic, is not often the subject of panels on the future of work, um, which offers things akin to payday loans for phones, um, as well as quote unquote free online services that are basically conduits for surveillance and predatory advertising for pretty vulnerable people. These should be much bigger parts of our conversation about the gig economy, about technology's role in this part of the economic um, sphere, and about the future of work more generally, and it's not yet. Um, so that's a big goal that I have for this book. Second, is that we really need to stop seeing white collar workers and their connectivity as the standard by which everyone else is measured. 
Um, so digital technologies in the workplace, um, and by that I mean consumer or personal technologies like phones and laptops, first really became integrated and widespread in the world of white collar office work. But 30 years later, we're still using this kind of connectivity, right? Often employer subsidized, robust connections at home and at a separate place that we used to call an office. Um, we use this as a measuring stick essentially to decide that everyone else is deficient. Um, these conditions though aren't normal, <laughs> um, they're exceptional and they're increasingly exceptional for larger and larger parts of our labor force, including more privileged workers. So we need to focus our attention not only on how people get excluded from access, although that is a very important thing to study, um, and the attendant kind of um, uh, push to get more people included, but on the terms of inclusion. Um, this focuses our attention on the institutional conditions that actually produce inequalities in the first place. In the case of this book, I focus on the institution of work. Low-wage workers uh, aren't deficient, right? They're not e excluded completely from access. They're actually including themselves on very unequal terms and are rewarded and punished in different ways than high-wage workers because of the different institutions of work that they encounter. So renaming or critiquing the idea of the digital divide and its cousin concept of um, digital inclusion is not new. Um, and it's not only, I'm not the only one um, doing this kind of thing. Um, and it's not only important because it's kind of tired and inaccurate in a lot of ways, um, but also because it kind of lets privilege off the hook, right? So if we know now that digital technologies can reproduce and not just solve inequality, which is a conversation we've been having for a while now, thank God, um, then we have to acknowledge and studies the way, study the ways that they also reproduce different kinds of privilege. So focusing on the ways that technology can reproduce privilege actually allowed me to see the ways that pushes for digital inclusion, um, things like the FCC's Lifeline program, for example, have actually been weaponized. Um, we've seen uh, right-wing pundits and politicians who have demonized marginalized groups for so-called wasteful spending on technology that in their eyes they don't need, right? So by not focusing on the ways that this, these technologies are increasingly important, necessary to these populations, um, and by kind of forgetting to study the ways that technologies can prop up different kinds of privilege, can be used very strategically to prop up privilege, that we often miss these kinds of cultural efforts. To kind of start wrapping up here on some of the findings and then um, to get into this conversation that I'm really excited to have, you know, we often assume that po the polarization of the labor market in the United States has led to a polarization of experiences of work. And in many ways it has, right? Um, highly educated, highly paid workers have pampered, relatively pampered working experiences, lots of autonomy at work increasingly, um, and lower wage workers have really seen the evacuation of all of those things, um, high degrees of alienation, things like that, um, in their working experiences. But um, this book really shows the really surprising convergence in a set of practices that, as Jenna mentioned, I called the digital hustle among um, independent and contingent workers. Uh, what defines precarity, though, uh, isn't only wages or employment relationships, but it's also a set of affective conditions or experiences. Um, and so one of the things that I like to I, I want to highlight about the book is the ways that economic insecurity is also emotional, right? It's not just um, about it, it is also about these objective conditions, but also about these more subjective ones. Um, and what I found is that these practices of hustling, um, they weren't only a set of strategies that were undertaken by workers to kind of cope with these conditions, but they were also a performance of security um, that fosters a sense of pride and dignity uh, in conditions that are often very hostile to it. Um, so of course, though, workers don't hustle under the same conditions, and these hustles are not received in the same ways by the context, by the social context in which they work. So the book also shows the conditions on which low and high wage gig workers include themselves into the digital economy and how these conditions privilege some and marginalize others. And so with that, I'll actually leave it there. Um, and uh, I would love to uh, start the conversation. I'm gonna turn it over to Aya who has 
some comments and reflections on this book, and then we'll get into kind of questions and some back and forth. Thank you so much. Um, and first, thank you to Julia for writing this book. Um, we've known each other for a while since Julia was postdoc when I started Data Society. And I really admire and appreciate her perspective on gig work and the importance of thinking about what makes a good job in this book. Um, and first, I'll just say, um, I'm pretty sure more thoughts will come up, you know, as I sit with what I've read. And uh, certainly, I got the message, you know, the political economy of digital access and inclusion for low wage workers is, is not being addressed. And moreover, the, the centering of the white collar worker in this debate is something that we'll get more into. So I won't discuss that. I just wanted to make a couple other reflections. Um, one is that in this moment, the conversation is all about people leaving their jobs for many reasons, burnout, um, exploitation being the two most commonly cited, but for some workers, they don't want to leave their job, or more importantly, they strive to import and improve their jobs. And actually, this is the space where collective action occurs. You know, if workers were so frustrated and leave, unions and, and collective action wouldn't occur, but workers see an opportunity to improve their workplace and fi find satisfaction because they see value in it despite the challenges. And so in some instances, worker, so this, this book actually gives a space for having that discussion about like, even though it's so precarious and so exploitative, what is it that is holding people there? In some instances, people, workers can't leave a job even when it is exploitative. Like we hear the stories of delivery workers having their tips stolen and asking to meet demanding customer expectations. Um, but they still find meaning somehow in the work. And I think this book gives us a glimpse into why that decision is so much more complicated than wages and hours. I guess it comes back to the line, if you don't like it, just leave. But we know what it means, but we don't know what it means to like a job or why someone stays in a job. I also appreciate the book's nod to thinking about what pulls the huge, this huge category of gig workers together or precarious workers together. What does the high earning programmer doing multiple contracts have in common with a task or a delivery worker operating in multiple platforms, essentially, essentially doing the same thing? And the book that examines that in a deeper way, this is a huge question facing worker and labor advocates who are trying to organize across sectors and create sort of a new understanding of like, what is this, what is class in this situation? The middle class is, is like we've seen, there's polarization, the middle class has disappeared, but is there a new class that's kind of being built in between we can't define yet and what brings them together? The book also starts to connect the research around technology and social media and technology of labor which tends to be separated. And I think it's interesting, I haven't thought about the word social capital in a very long time. And now it's being brought back in a different way. How is the social about social media or social data trails and how does that connect to capital and the labor of it? I mean, we don't really have conversations about Facebook and labor outside of maybe, you know, some discussions about employers checking one's Facebook profile to make sure that you haven't done something that they disagree with. And then lastly, I think I really appreciate how Julia demonstrates the infrastructural nature of digital technologies to both work, but also inequality, and specifically tries to tackle issues of race and gender in a field where class dominates tends to flatten or not attend to these issues. And this has been for a challenge for me for me as well, at least, and I and probably others as well. So I'm very excited to get into the discussion about that as well. And I will end my remarks there. Thanks, Baiha. Um, I'm gonna jump in and just kind of build on some some uh, topics that we've already touched on and dig in a little deeper. And I think one thing I found really unique and interesting about this book was that was the group you interviewed, like the your sample, for lack of a better word. There's something I think unusual thinking of all the books kind of in this space. So I'm, I'm thinking of like Mel Gregg's book on counterproductive or Mary Gray's book on gig workers. Um, they're, they're books about white collar workers. They're books about low wage workers, gig workers, but you bring them all together. Um, and I think your message is loud and clear that low wage workers and the relevance of tech, that's not, it's not just gig workers, right? That's not the entirety of who's affected in low, low wage work by tech. Um, so I want to push on that a little bit and ask uh, about that, about that decision to kind of look at such a heterogeneous group of workers. Um, what do you think is to be gained from highlighting common conditions across workers with 
really different status positions and different degrees of agency. And then I'll tee up the next question, which is, is there, is there a danger in that? <laughs> um, and how do you, I mean, how can you steer people to not misinterpret your book, which is something that happens when you put stuff out into the world, people will misinterpret it. Yeah, this, this is a really good question. And I should say in, in, designing this research, I didn't expect to find these similarities. Um, so I should say that, uh, you know, the by drawing on this like broader kind of sociological definition of precarious work, instead of this kind of app or tech centric um, version of it, thinking about these issues across class is relatively common, right? Um, that in defining precarious work as um, folks that have contingent uh, temporary independent relationships with their employers or with their clients, meaning they don't have the expectation of future work, which is job insecurity. They have few benefits um, or guarantees of continued employment. Um, they often you know, pay taxes in a particular way, but sometimes not. Um, and drawing on that kind of uh, broader definition drew me to this question of needing to talk about social class, right? So it, that came directly from this larger sociological literature looking at precarity. Um, but as the, as the conversation, as I mentioned kind of before, as I was watching this conversation unfold with high anxiety um, as, I was, as I was conducting this research, what I realized that was that the conversation about tech and precarious work was kind of falling out along a really interesting line where instead of comparing these groups to each other or even acknowledging that they existed in the same universe, that we started seeing these, um, these studies, you know, the ones, the ones that you mentioned are, are really stellar examples of this, um, that really, I even think about um, uh, Greg's earlier book, uh, Works Intimacy, right? Um, looking at flexibility in white collar work and digital technologies that really focused on only one group, one type of worker, right? Kind of said like, I'm only gonna focus on um, white collar workers um, and kind of talked about them wonderfully within that class context, right? And I should say Mary, Mary Gray and Siddharth Suri's book does, does this same thing. Um, but the picture that we ended up getting of like what technology was relevant in the gig economy was for white collar workers, it was like, how are white collar workers kind of winning the gig economy, right? How are these freelancers transforming work with their laptops and the cafes and the sun-drenched offices, right? We, and we work, right? It was like that, that kind of creative economy, Richard Florida, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then this completely separate conversation about exploitation and coercion and apps and being forced, you know, these low wage workers being forced to use these apps in different kinds of ways and these absolutely important and horrific stories of, you know, ride hail drivers who, you know, had the rug, um, or not even just ride hail drivers, but taxi drivers who had the rug pulled out from underneath them um, by these companies and were being forced to transition in this way, right? And to me, as a kind of uh, inherently like comparative thinker, um, it was obvious that these two stories were connected, um, but I just didn't know how to talk about it really um, at that point. And I didn't know that really using this larger sociological definition of precarious work would help me kind of integrate those two stories together. I didn't expect to see the similarities that I did, honestly, in the actual um, strategies, in the kind of the ways that people were actually using their technologies, the ways they were talking about them. That was striking. I was drawn to kind of using this larger definition because I think that it allows the hope, my hope is, is that allows us to kind of see the connections between these two storylines about the quote unquote future of work um, that haven't really been connected yet, I think, in our, in our public conversations. Do you see potential there for labor organizing? And I'm thinking right off the bat of Google's um, Alphabet Workers Union, which brought together you know, white collar knowledge workers and contract workers who are paid much less, who are on, um, you know, short-term benefit free <laughs> sometimes uh, contracts with, with Google. Um, that seems like an example where those two seemingly very different groups found common cause. And do you see possibilities for that? And maybe Aiha has some thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I can say just really quickly about how excited I was about that. 
Um, and, you know, I, I, I have schooled me, right? Like in a lot of ways, when I was a postdoc in many ways, um, when I was a postdoc at Data and Society working um, for that, for this, this research group, for her research group is in thinking about cross-class organizing, right? And that it's kind of like the white whale of, um, you know, labor organizing and how do we do this? How do we create these kinds of alliances? How do we show people um, these common conditions that we are all subject to and to create these kinds of um, even limited kinds of alliances or limited forms of solidarity, right? For the purposes of specific things across class. And for me, you know, as a qualitative, you know, ethnographic interviewer, where I feel like I can add to that is in talking about the deep, what Arlie Hoekstra calls like the deep story, right? Like what are people's feelings? How are people's, what are people's affective realities? And what was so striking to me as I was doing these interviews was how similarly, you know, my freelance uh, or my, you know, independent nonprofit lawyers were talking about feeling like they were good at their jobs and what was showing them that they were good at their jobs and the ways that, you know, folks who are doing freelance <laughs> lawn care or doing hair and working at retail service at right, like who were at very different ends of the labor market talked about feeling prideful, feeling like their work was dignified and creating that dignity for themselves because of these practices that they had with their tech because of the prompt and professional and effective ways that they were able to use these technologies to make do in this very kind of chaotic environment that they felt that they were in. And, you know, with definitely with IHA in the back of my mind, kind of saying like, I need to talk about this, right? Um, that this is a, this could be a potentially powerful thing to affirm these affective experiences across class and say me, me, me too, in some kinds of ways, right? Like we're, we're both um, using these things in similar ways, feeling these kind of similar ways and feeling prideful about this kind of work um, in a way that is often not reflected, I think in, in our scholarship. And I, I include myself in this um, as a critic of these forms of work. I just want to add that I think um, Julia, in the book, you make this uh, you make this comment. There are two two comments on time. The first one is that you know those markers, those traditional markers of success, are gone in a lot of in a lot of this gig work. But it, you see it across sectors, and so it's the model of how work is being organized that's changing. And so people are finding new meaning because they do need people do need have this sense that they're doing something that has meaning in their work. And I also just wanted to to talk about it. I'm trying to remember the. The paragraph, but you talk about um, workers are again about centering on a struggle to control their feelings as at work, as a way of like how workers use this digital technology, um, and I think one of the things that I've seen through organizing is that the the sort of like traditional bread and butter organizing issues, wages, health benefits, they're they're still there, but there are these other issues that are related to you know, how someone is made to feel at work, like if they're treated differently because they have, their hair is different or they have anything that's considered special accommodations. There are these little indignities about who they are that sort of we're seeing across high wage work and low wage work. You know, a lot of the organizing that's happening in tech sector is not around wages. It's not around health benefits, it's around these other issues. And in low wage labor as well, much of the early organizing in Starbucks was about whether people could have tattoos. So it was really a different, you know, and we're starting to see this like new level of issues that affect people. And I think it is related to affect. This, this actually reminds me, if I can just add one thing to this, um, is that when we think about upcoming legislation and like battles that we're gearing up for and have been, you know, fighting for a little while around things like the PRO Act, right? Like that's not just geared at low wage workers, although it is something that we talk about a lot when we think about, you know, who is, who is potentially helped by, you know, different kinds of legislation around independent contracting. Um, and that if we can build these alliances in some way um, that we can gain, you know, more visibility for these kinds of how, how uh, important these kinds of fights are um, for different types of workers, instead of focusing, hyper-focusing on these kinds of different groups in a very diverse, right. And heterogeneous part of the labor market. I want to, um, pick up on something that's been brought up and, and move into talking a little bit more about that focus on dignity and work. And I will just very briefly mention some research that I've done um, with rural workers in central Oregon. 
um, looking at the data center industry and um, the shift from like traditional rural natural resource industries, timber, um, but also manufacturing, a lot of that work has just disappeared. And there's this new promise of like working at a data center. But um, there's been a big effort in Central Oregon where I've done research to try and make that palatable and make that make sense as a kind of valued work for blue collar men in particular in that community. And it's really not about skill or about um, pay. It's about whether this is the kind of work someone like me does. Um, and it's been a lot of the, the work around data centers has been cast as like manual labor. It's like electrical work, it's skilled labor, it's, it's blue collar work. And that seems to be really important in that community. And so I think your book really resonated with that theme that if we're thinking very quantitatively and in economic terms and in terms of skills, we are missing a whole part of the story about why people do the work they do. So I wanna ask, um, I also wanna push a little bit on this idea that people see themselves as doing valued work, being you know, entrepreneurial or being skilled because some people would look at that and say, oh, look at how people are kind of participating in their own exploitation. Um, what do you think about that, that angle on it? Are people, how do, how do we make sense of working conditions that seem really um, harsh and in need of reform and workers' willingness to um, kind of participate in that and see it as uh, something that benefits them? And how does all of that relate to dignity and work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, this, is a, <laughs> this is a hard question. Um, and I'm still working on an a, a good answer <laughs> for it. Um, so I'm, I, I would love to hear um, what other folks, uh, other folks' suggestions too um, in the Q and A or in the comments too. For me, it comes down to it is exploitative, <laughs> right? Um, and I don't think we get anywhere by saying that it's not, right? Especially as researchers, like it's a part of it's a part of my obligation to say like, yes, this is bad. These are bad working conditions, but exploitation and entrepreneurship is not mutually exclusive, right? Like um, they can exist together. Um, and exploitative work relationships have for a long time existed alongside people creating dignity for themselves in those positions. Um, it's true in the in apps. It's true in this kind of new precarity that we're seeing. It's true in the old precarity, right? Um, in, my, in my more recent work, my kind of current research projects and looking at um, care workers, especially nannies and babysitters using online platforms. And, you know, we know care work is rife with exploitation. Um, it is built upon the exploitation of women of color. Um, that's what propels that economy um, in, in this country and in many others. But is that work not also extremely meaningful and extremely, can be extremely dignified um, and dignity conferring in a lot of ways? Absolutely. Um, and so we have to be able to see the ways that these things work alongside each other. But beyond that, even just them kind of existing in parallel, the other thing that I think is really important and the thing that I kind of got to in this book, but I'm looking forward to doing more explicitly with future projects is to, looking at, is to look at the ways that exploitation itself is productive of these experiences, right? Um, and that it's not... Uh, it's not just productive in terms of profits um, for employers or for platforms or for, you know, um, companies like Verizon who are profiting from all these low wage workers having to buy um, smartphones, but it's also productive of affective experiences too, right? Um, and that those, the connection between those things is not an accident. Um, it's not merely a co-occurrence because people make meaning in the worst circumstances in their lives. Um, it's just what we do. Um, but it, it's related in a much more kind of intimate way, right? And in both dark and bright, right? In, in ways that are both useful um, and helpful for organizing and pushing for better conditions and in ways that foster further alienation and exploitation as well, right? And that kind of lock people into these dynamics. Of course, the thing that I think, Jenna, that you're getting at and that, that I have, um, I've struggled with with this book is that this should not, lead to the conclusion, kind of affirming that, that these affective experiences should not lead to the conclusion that like, oh, if people feel good about it, then it's fine, <laughs> right? Then 
Like if you like it, then you like it and you should go ahead and do it. And we don't have to do anything about it. Right. Um, or like, as long as we can have everybody have their technology equal, then we have technology equal. Everybody's feeling good about it. That's fine. Right. Like that's all we can do. You know, people can be mistreated and still proud <laughs> of what they're doing um, within those bad situations. So um, I think what, what, where I come down on this is kind of saying like, we get nowhere, I think as research in research or in advocacy or in, you know, in um, critiquing these arrangements by telling workers that they don't feel how they feel or that they're being tricked, right? Um, and I think that's how I can kind of contribute to this conversation or that I can contribute to this. Um, either whether they're being tricked by kind of clever employers or they're being tricked by clever apps or clever technology companies um, that they're feeling something that's not real, uh, that it's just, it's a losing prospect, right? So I think, you know, we kind of need to back up and like affirm that these things um, are real um, and that they can exist at the same time um, and kind of proceed <laughs> from that point instead of having these fights about, um, you know, false consciousness or being tricked into a false identity. I, I just have, uh, I think I have one maybe coherent thought around this. We'll see. I will definitely say that. Thank, thank you for saying that, um, Julia. It is exploitative, but it's interesting to see this sort of like contrast between a you know, a, a regular low wage job and like an entrepreneurial job. And there's almost this unspoken recognition now that low wage work is exploitative. People have maybe not been willing to say that for a really long time, but the solution is be your own boss. And nobody recognizes that as potentially exploitative as well. Maybe now a little bit in some gig work, but for certain classes of people, it's not. And I think it's important to really draw that out that they operate within the same system. I mean, if you think about it, sort of this, like, the, the new entrepreneurialism is the new American dream. You cannot now have a middle-class job, buy that home and have that great life. But in theory, if you were to become your own boss, you could achieve that. So it's sort of just like displaced. It's just morphed that message of like the American dream, American exceptionalism as part of it. Um, in terms of like, when we think about that and efforts to transition people to jobs in this less exploitative environment where they can actually accomplish these things. I think it's still buying into the same, into that same narrative. And it wouldn't be the first time that we've tried to, you know, I, I remember reading articles about teaching a minor to code that didn't go very far, nor did encouraging men to go into healthcare, which is a booming industry, which is supposed to be future proof, or I hate that word, but I really don't know. I'm not even sure what it means. Um, <laughs> but jobs that will be around for a while, and that was also not successful there. So there is definitely something to be said about, you know, uh, this other category of is it's not just about jobs. It's not just, or it's just not just about money. It's not just about being secure. There is issues of identity and what people want in their employment. Building on what you've said, Julia, about trusting what people say about themselves. I think like, I just want to promote that as like the essence of good ethnographic interviewing is to treat people's subjective experience as a kind of truth. It is a truth of how they see themselves. It is a truth about how they experience the world around them. And when I teach research methods, that's sort of like the first counterintuitive thing I have to teach is like, it's, you're not interviewing people to figure out if they're telling you the truth, that whatever they say is, is um, something they want you to think about themselves. It's something they think about themselves. And there's something really important to that. And I think that's the strength of doing, doing this kind of interviewing um, is that very unique kind of data. Um, I want to ask before we start getting into questions, I want to ask about the digital divide as a concept, as a frame, um, which I've also long struggled with and resisted and critiqued. And the question I have, because your book clearly is saying that this kind of, some people have access and some people don't, is really the wrong way to look at it, because we're talking about low-wage workers who one might assume are excluded. They're not excluded, they're included, but the question is, what are the terms of inclusion? I think that's the, the term you use. Like there's a, the possibility of being disadvantageously included and we have to look at that. Do you think this is something that's always been true or is this sort of a fact of the moment where tech is so ubiquitous that we just, we can't really talk about it that way anymore. It's, it's, not, 
except in some circumstances, it's really not useful to kind of look at the people who have tech as the people who are going to get advantages and the people who don't as the people who are falling behind. And if, if that term, if that phrase is not useful, is there another phrase we can use? Uh, so I'm gonna answer your last question first and then I'll back up and answer your first question. The other phrase that we can use is inequality. <laughs> like, um, I don't think we, and I say this as somebody who teaches several courses on digital inequality at, at, um, at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, you know, I think the digital label, like, you know, signals things about what it is that we're talking about in a useful way, in a shorthand way. Um, but what we're talking about is social inequality, right? Like that is at base what we're talking about here. Um, and I think as a sociologist, this hits home particularly hard because we have so many theoretical tools to use to understand inequality. Our field has been doing it for a long time, <laughs> right? Um, and, uh, you know, the approach that we've taken so far in looking at digital inequalities, which has been really strongly characterized by the digital divide, although not for long, I think. Um, we have, you know, a whole class, lots of different people, I should say. I'm in like the third generation of scholars who are, you know, pushing back against this um, from a lot of different really exciting angles. Um, and they're showing the ways that these, these theories, these analytical ideas, these approaches that have been used to talk about um, other forms of social stratification, other kinds of processes, um, whether cultural or um, material, they're applicable here, <laughs> right? Um, so I use a couple of them um, in, in this book. I talk about different forms of capital, like I was saying um, in the chapter where I talk about privilege, right? I borrow that directly from um, Seamus Khan, who wrote a really wonderful book on privilege and looking at how privilege um, shapes social stratification, um, how you know, uh, different kinds of, he looks at school children, but I kind of apply the same thing to looking at social media, as I have mentioned, right? Like our comfort and ease with, um, with using these tools, with integrating them, our personal life and our, our professional life so seamlessly that that is a signal of privilege, right? And that we need to look at who gets that privilege and who doesn't, right? And who, how that ease, how that comfort with blending our personal and professional networks through social media, the way that that is a rarefied thing. Um, and it is not actually, um, it's the exception, it's not the rule, right? Um, and it's also punished in many different kinds of work contexts. It's not only actively encouraged in some white collar contexts, but it's also actively punished or penalized um, for other workers that I, that, I, that I show in that chapter. So the first is like, let's use the tools that we have because we have a lot of them. Um, and I'm not the only person who, who has said this and who's, who's kind of on this, this train. Um, but you asked another question, Jenna, but, um, before that about, you know, is, is there something unique about this moment um, in, in digital technologies, right? Like how do we characterize what the digital is doing that's different maybe in some ways? And, you know, I draw on um, Louise Seamster's idea of predatory inclusion um, in the book quite a lot, um, because I think, you know, as a communication scholar, um, I'm going to put that hat on, I'll take my sociologist hat on, I'll put the communication scholar hat on. Um, when I look at the, the political economy of these markets, right, I see consolidation among um, these, these telecom companies, right? Um, I see Verizon buying uh, SmartPay, I think it was, or not SmartPay, um, talk, uh, Straight Talk Wireless, and, you know, these other kinds of uh, acquisitions and, you know, consolidations in this market. I should say, you know, I owe everything to my colleagues, both Emeritus and, um, and current at Annenberg for teaching me this kind of approach to looking at telecom, um, that that has a lot to do with how this inclusion happens, right? Um, these kinds of uh, pushes from industry to capitalize on the necessity of these technologies for low wage workers is not something that is unique to com, right? It's not something that's unique to telecom to tech. As, as uh, Seamster and her colleagues show, it happens in access to student loans. It happens in access to college, right? Um, anytime we see a really high price, high cost good become extraordinarily necessary, um, we see 
exploitation, we see predatory inclusion. Matt Desmond shows this with housing, right? It happens all over um, different types of markets, right? And is ultimately comes down to, you know, the operations of capitalism. Um, not necessarily anything that's unique to these technologies themselves. So in, in my mind, you know, hopefully opening this up a little bit, again, what I said before about, you know, opening our, opening the, the goggles a little bit to see like different, the way that different types of technologies enter into this frame. Um, when we take this broader perspective on precarious work, um, that's another kind of benefit of that is that we start to see these similarities maybe across um, different domains of, of social life where, uh, low wage workers are not only being squeezed um, by their telecom providers, but also by their landlords, by their um, loans, by their right. We start to see the interconnections between these fights um, that are happening in different parts of the economy. That is also a really exciting um, potential for you know political action. I think we've got a good set of questions now, and I'm going to use my privilege as a host to kind of pick and choose. And I've picked two that I really want to ask you. So the first one is about time. And this is a question coming from Maro in Athens, Greece. So um, Maro says that in their own research, they find the experience of time to be the connecting thread. Um, precarity is economic and emotional, but also very temporal. Time becoming ever more fragmented and unintelligible across seemingly polarized jobs. Did you find in your interview scripts of resistance that relate to shifting the meaning or experience of time? And I will say, having read your book, yes, you did. Time is definitely a theme. Time and managing time and grappling with time and struggling with time, that's a theme. But what, what do you say to this, this as an answer to this question? Uh, first of all, thank you for joining from Greece. Um, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and that sounds very cool. I want to hear more about that research. Um, I also want to shout out my um, my uh, my buddy Ben Snyder's book, um, The Disrupted Workplace, on exactly this idea too, on like the experience of time in precarious capitalism. Um, it's a great book. Yes, absolutely, time. Um, I actually had this experience um, that I thought I should write about a little bit at some point of as an interviewer interviewing precarious workers, your life also becomes like kind of precarious in some ways, um, just because of the scheduling practices and, you know, the way that the realities of their work looks. Um, you know, there were times that we, I, I, I would not schedule an interview with these folks a week in advance. Like you can't, um, it's, it's an impossible ask to say like, oh, how about next Thursday, right? They're like, what do you mean next? That could be next year. Like I, that doesn't mean anything to me. Um, so we would often have like a block of time. We'd be like, all right, well, Thursday afternoon sometime, right, would be a good time for me usually. Um, and then, you know, we would check in on Thursday morning and say like, all right, what does your afternoon look like? You know, where can, what part of the city are you going to be in? Where can I meet you? Um, so there's this way that um, I was in, and I don't want to say I was in tune, but that my schedule reflected a bit of that um, of that temporality of what it felt like um, to be uh, on another, on multiple other people's clocks, right? Because, um, you know, while this is often talked about as, you know, being your own boss, you know, we talked about these themes before, what ultimately ends up happening when you're stringing together different types of gigs is that you're not on your own time. You're not on your own clock. You're actually on everybody else's clock, right? Um, so everybody else's schedule and their trickle down issues, their doctor's appointment, their, you know, subway breakdown, whatever it is, affects you. Um, and then also affects the lady who's trying to interview you, me. Um, and so it, um, it was, it was a really, really personal kind of experience of this temporal thing that you're talking about. Um, just to call out one specific kind of finding that I found that was interesting is um, having to do with gender um, a little bit. This is in, uh, I think maybe this is part of what Jenna is talking about that one of, the, one of the threads that I noticed um, among workers was that when they were trying to use their technologies, um, you know, they all use the technology to resist work in different kinds of ways or to, to, to control their feelings about their work in different ways. Um, I found that a lot of the um, high wage workers would kind of physically like put their phones or put their devices away, turn them off, right, in times when, um, when they didn't wanna be disrupted, whether that was at work or at home. Um, except if you were a mom. <laughs> um, and that was not a thing that they felt that they were able to do. Um, and they were always interruptible. They always had to be connected. Um, whether or not that was allowed by their workplace, whether or not that was something they wanted, 
um, whether they were going to be punished for having their phone in the back pocket of their jeans um, to make sure that their kids babysitter could call them, you know, if there was a problem or something like that, it was just something that they had to do. So there was this sense of um, the bleeding of time or the blending of time that was a gendered privilege um, that I was able to see um, in that. And I should say gendered privilege, but also privilege of people who were didn't have care obligations of other, of other um, means too. There were other folks who were caring for um, incarcerated family members or for aging parents or something like that too, that, you know, exceeded the bounds of gender. Although I did see it most strongly um, in, in the moms uh, that I interviewed. So that was one of the more specific things, but yes, absolutely. And then there's a question I want to get to just because it's something I'm a little obsessed with, which is um, risk shifting. So Amanda Bergson Shilcock asks about how your research intersects with the work of Dr. Tressie McMillan Cottom on risk shifting. So how workers have been pushed into taking individual responsibility for their post-secondary education and then exploited by for-profit schools or colleges. Um, I mean, I'll just add a little little spin on this, I think um, shift scheduling, I've gotten a little obsessed with how shift scheduling has changed and how workers are on call and um, aren't able to take second jobs and don't, and as, as you've already mentioned, like don't have predictable schedules week to week and what that means for things like childcare and whether they can continue their education and all of that is sort of thrown into chaos. So what do you, what do you have to say about um, risk shifting and, and Dr. Cottom's work? Yeah, absolutely. I, I um, you know, I really admire her work and, you know, thinking about, um, you know, her earlier book and the stuff that she's working on now that's like even more closely kind of aligned with thinking about economic practices and, um, and digital technologies certainly has been extremely generative. Um, you know, this conversation about precarity, um, this kind of wider sociological conversation about precarity that I've been referencing throughout, um, one of the hallmarks of that, and I should say not even just precarity related to work, but precarity of life, right? Including access to education, including access to um, a stable home and you know, lots of different types of um, insecurity that are now much more endemic than they were before is um, focuses on this idea of the risk shift, right? And the ways that increasingly the risks of living a life are being shifted onto the backs of the people who are least able to bear them um, in a way, or who, or who are um, who face the most volume of risk, um, and that the folks who uh, are able to insulate themselves with their capital or with institutions um, bear much less of of um, those risks of everyday life, and that increasingly the experiences of either being responsible for those risks or not bifurcates, right, our experiences of life in, in many ways, um, polarizes our experiences. So I should say, um, you know, there's some great work um, that really utilizes this idea of the risk shift. Um, Alexandria Ravenel's book on hustle and gig really um, places uh, platform-based gig work within this like wider conversation about the great risk shift, right, that we've seen. Um, in uh, you know what Ulrich Beck has called the risk society now, where the distribution of risks have has changed over time. Um, so yeah, I should say that this is um, this is a, a key part of kind of thinking about the wider conditions within which the the gig economy takes place. Where I see my work kind of contributing to that a little bit uniquely in this kind of affective experience of it, right? To say like, well, how do people navigate this in their feelings? Um, because it's not always in the ways that we might think, right? Um, insecurity feels a particular kind of way, but our reactions to that can vary really wildly um, and really widely depending on you know who you are and um, different kinds of, uh, different kinds of reactions that, that we each have um, to, to those kinds of risks. So I think what we've seen is the kind of valorization, cultural valorization of one particular reaction, which is this idea of like entrepreneurialism and diving into the risk and risk is a great thing. And right, like let's make it our, let's succeed and thrive through this you know um, environment of risk. That's one way of kind of emo like emotionally responding to it that's very valid validated and valued in American culture, especially. Um, but it's not the only one. you know there's people who are uh, you know kind of reluctant acceptors of, of this kind of environment. There are people who wish it could be otherwise. 
There are people who have been in more secure jobs and saw that that sucked in different ways because they needed more flexibility for their childcare or for whatever it was. And so they're kind of accepting these risks in a bargain or in a transaction for that kind of flexibility. Um, so I think what was interesting to me was the ways that um, were the ways that this really culturally valorized um, reaction to risk, this risk shift, entrepreneurship, and really, um, you know, the kind of celebration of it was really only one way, you know, that people kind of reacted to that it was important, right? And it provided people a vocabulary of moral worth um, to say that this can be valuable. And I understand, you know, I can, I can kind of claim some of that for myself, um, but uh, it was only one of many types of reactions that I think people had to that. So we have an hour has flown by. <laughs> We're at the end of our time. There are still other interesting questions you should take a look at and people can follow up with Julia directly. There's questions about cognitive labor and about the material conditions and differences in work environments. There's a question asking whether we should still consider some aspects of the digital divide um, as relevant, like forms of access and non-access. I mean, I would say, yes, um, it's not a completely useless frame. Um, so follow up with Julia about that. And I want to give you a chance to say if there's any main takeaway you really want people to remember from this discussion, Julia, or from a key takeaway from your book. I, that's a lot of pressure, maybe, but <laughs> give it a shot. <laughs> no big deal. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the main takeaways that I think um, in terms of, you know, what I want people to, to take away from this book is, you know, if we are rightly riled up and critical of um, apps like Uber, Lyft, Instacart, right? Like these, the tipping practices, the employment, all of that stuff. If we follow each of those twists and turns with as much interest as I know I do, right? Um, and maybe one of the reasons why you're in this call is you're researching or you're involved in these issues, then please, please also care about employers who who have a scheduling app that they require workers to download um, in order to trade shifts or in order to see their benefits information. Um, we should also be critical of the employers who do not subsidize their employees um, connectivity at all. Um, we should also be critical of the telecom companies that are offering uh, these payday loans um, for phones for folks who that to make to make connectivity appear affordable when it's really not. Um, we should also be, you know, critical and be upset about companies that thinly disguise free resume builder services um, as free, right, and kind of helping people when they're really just conduits for surveillance and, and exploitative advertising practices. So please look at, don't let these technology companies limit our vision of what tech counts um, and what kinds of um, harms matter. Uh, for this group of workers um, and to use the tools that we, meaning, you know, um, social scientists, social researchers have to analyze work and not cede that power to, um, to the discourse or to these companies in a much more limited way. I think that's the, that's one of the bigger takeaways. That is a great concluding comment. Um, I'm, I'm going to wrap us up and just mention that you can buy Julia's book, <laughs> visit the Data and Society website, which will have a lot of follow-up materials, things we've mentioned and discussed in this um, session today. Um, this is the fourth in us, a book forum series. There's actually another one though coming up um, with Jesse Daniels on her new book. Um, so this isn't the end of our book presentations. Um, and we this, is, this platform is meant to um, offer scholars and researchers a way to present their work to frame key debates in the field and to gather feedback from our research community. Um, thank you ever, so much everyone for joining us. Thank you IHOP for joining us and, and sparking really interesting conversations. Thank you Nazli and Rigo for being behind the scenes and getting everything set up for us. And um, the conversation will continue. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Thanks everybody. <laughs>